Welcome back to the MD Edge Daily News. I'm your host, Nick Andrews. We hope you and yours had a happy and safe holiday. Today, Emma Sizuma beats Factor 8 prophylaxis by a wide margin. Oro dental issues are often associated with facial port wine stains, and epilepsy often accompanies congenital Zika infections. But we begin today with FDA approval for two different once daily HIV drugs. This is according to a Merck Pharmaceutical release. Those drugs are Delstringo and Pifeltro. Delstringo is a fixed dose combination tablet of Dorovirine, Lamivudine, and Tenofovir Dizaproxyl Fumarate. Pifeltro is a non nucleoside reverse transcripsate inhibitor to be used in combination with other antiretroviral medicines. Both drugs are indicated for treating HIV-1 in adult patients with no prior antiretroviral treatment. In a statement, Merck notes that the drugs are not curative. Approval for Delstrigo is based on the findings from the Drive Ahead trial in which over 700 patients were randomly assigned to receive either Delstrigo or the control. In the study, Delstrigo was associated with sustained viral suppression through 48 weeks, thus meeting the primary endpoint of non-inferior efficacy. Pifeltro was approved based on the Drive Forward trial, which had a similar design structure to Drive Ahead. In this study, Pifeltro also achieved the primary endpoint of non-inferior efficacy. You can read more about the Drive trials by clicking the link in the description. Emesizumab therapy outperformed factor 8 prophylaxis for patients with hemophilia A who do not have factor 8 inhibitors. This is according to results of a randomized open-label phase 3 trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine. In the Haven 3 trial, researchers randomly assigned 152 patients with hemophilia A into one of four groups. Groups A, B, and C consisted of patients who had previously been receiving episodic factor 8 therapy while Group D consisted of patients who had previously received Factor VIII prophylaxis. Groups A, B, and D received dosages of emesizumab, while Group C received no prophylaxis. Dr. Johnny Malangu is a researcher at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. Dr. Malangu says that for patients with severe hemophilia A, Factor VIII infusions are standard prophylaxis for bleeding events. However, because of the short half-life of Factor VIII, multiple infusions are needed each week, and bleeding events may still occur. And orodental issues are often associated with facial port wine stains. This is according to data presented at the annual meeting of the Society of Pediatric Dermatology. Dr. David Morrow says that several years ago, he began to notice a pattern in the conversation threads on websites dedicated to support for patients of children with facial port wine stains. He says that parents were reporting that dental problems arose earlier on their child's side of the face with PWS and that the alveolar ridge was lower on the side of the face that harbored the lesion. Dr. Morrow is the director of the Center for Hemangiomas and Vascular Birthmarks at the Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia. Speaking at the meeting, Dr. Morrow says that after searching literature and not finding much, he and his colleagues sought to characterize the manifestations of port wine stains in the oral cavity via an anonymous paired survey of volunteers with facial port wine stains, as well as their dentists who were recruited from birthmarks.com and 10 collaborating physician practices. He reports that the five most common oral manifestations reported by patients are lip hyperplasia, stained gingiva, malocclusion, bleeding gingiva, and spacing between the teeth. He also reports that when researchers examined patients who had stained gingiva versus those who did not, they found that early stage lesions demonstrated a reddish blush of the oral mucosa and gingiva, while late stage lesions demonstrated increased blush of the oral tissues, as well as hyperplasia of the soft tissue or bone in the affected area. He says that the findings are important because capillary malformations of the oral cavity may result in periodontal disease associated with gingival overgrowth. And finally today, a connection between epilepsy and congenital Zika. 
Epilepsy occurred in approximately two-thirds of infants with congenital Zika virus infection. This is according to the results of a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine. In the study, researchers reviewed data from 141 infants between 1 and 14 months old with a median age of 9 months and Zika virus infection confirmed by lab analysis. The researchers report that the prevalence of epilepsy was 67%, and that about three-quarters of the children experienced seizures at six months or younger. All of the epileptic infants were treated with anti-epileptic medications, and about two-thirds achieved remission. Of the remissions, more than two-thirds received monotherapy, while the rest received polytherapy. The drugs most associated with seizure control were vigabaritin, levetiractam, valproate, and fiobarbital. The researchers know that the prevalence of epilepsy in this study was higher than that seen in previous studies, and most patients had early-onset drug-resistant epilepsy. However, burst suppression patterns and hypsorrhythia on EEG predict more severe disease and suggest that epilepsy might complicate cases of congenital Zika infection. And that concludes the Tuesday edition of the MD Edge Daily News. This marks our 150th edition of The Daily News, and we'd like to thank each and every one of you for choosing us. And if this is your first time listening, you can subscribe to the MD Edge Daily News on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Alexa, and Spotify. For MD Edge, I'm Nick Andrews.